Hello, I'm Brooke Wilkie. I work at the Kellogg Biological Station as part of our long-term agroecosystem research project. And we've been installing prairie strips in this project and part of other projects that are long-term research efforts at our station. And I'm excited to tell you a little bit more about how they can fit into the farm landscapes in Michigan. So when we're thinking about installing prairie strips in a farm landscape, we consider a number of factors, including where we might be vulnerable to erosion. We're also looking to add biodiversity benefits uh, to our fields, such as wildlife, insects, pollinators, things that could be helpful for our crops and other things that could just be enhancing biodiversity for the landscape. When we think about where to put these prairie strips in our fields, we consider those factors as well as the history of our fields and particularly focusing on what parts of the fields have historically yielded well and been profitable and what parts of the fields haven't yielded so well because there are definitely areas of our fields that vary in this context. So one of the areas that we typically find are lower yielding are along the edges of our fields. And these could be areas where we turn around a lot, but it could also be along tree lines where trees provide uh, some competition for resources and the crops don't do so well. We've also looked for sites that have obstacles in the fields, such as power poles, that when we farm around them, they typically result in overlap of applications and inefficiency in the farming. One final thing we considered when we installed our prairie strips is how the prairie strips might fit with our farming equipment because every farm has different sized equipment. And ideally, you don't wanna put a prairie strip in a field where it might result in you needing to have overlap in your seeding so the CP43 program provides some guidelines for what we can and can't do uh, in regards to putting prairie strips. These prairie strips have to be at least 30 feet wide, but a no, no wider than 120 feet. And they can be as long as you want. It could be the whole length of your field or it could be part of the field. You also can't put more than 25% of a total field into prairie strips. So it has to be less than 25%. So when we're planting these prairie strips as part of the CP43 program, we need to make sure and have plant mixtures that are in sync with the program guidelines. And most all of the plants that we're selecting are native perennials. Most of these are herbaceous grasses and forbs, but there are also shrub options in CP43. You have to make sure and plant a mixture that doesn't become dominated by these native grasses. So we have to plant at least three different species and we can't plant any more than five pounds per acre of these grasses when we convert it to pure live seeds. And we also have to plant forbs in these mixtures, which could be uh, a number of different species. Some common ones are coneflowers um, and other asters. And we have to have at least one and a half pounds per acre of these wildflowers or forbs in the mixture as well so that we have some flowering plants. Now, when we planted our prairie strips at KBS, we were choosing species that deliberately gave us flowering and pollinator resources throughout the year. So we wanted to have species that were flowering in the spring all the way through the summer and fall and have a grasses in the mixture that weren't going to be too competitive with these flowering species. So we ended up with two pounds per acre of grass seed spread across four species, and we chose not to include switchgrass because switchgrass can be pretty competitive in some environments. And then we also had two pounds per acre of wildflower seeds, and that was spread across 18 different species to try to give us that, you know, flowering across the whole year uh, dynamic. When we're installing these prairie strips, we need to consider several factors. First and most importantly is probably the site history. In many situations, it's ideal to be planting these in a field that has been farmed with annual crops. In those settings, we usually have bare soil to work with. Starting with a, a clean slate kind of gives us an advantage. However, 
that's where we have to consider herbicide history because some of our annual crops do have herbicides applied to them that last for a while in the soil. And so knowing that history of herbicide combined with the crops and the potential weed pressure can help us plan effectively for when and how to establish the prairie strips. Now, when we go to plant them, there might be options to use no-till options and plant right into the field. Potentially, we might want to use tillage as well to help uh, provide a better seed bed uh, or to smooth out existing ruts in the field or something that might be limiting the establishment. Both opportunities uh, are available to seed, but we need to consider the history to make the best choice. So when you're planning for these prairie strip installations, take a soil test so you know the pH and fertility profile of your soils and apply lime and fertilizer according to needs determined by the soil test and the MSU recommendations for grasses and shrubs. If you're gonna be planting a prairie strip into an area that has existing cover, potentially perennial grasses, you're gonna to wanna to mow, burn, or apply herbicides as needed to control unwanted vegetation before planting the prairie strip. When you do get to plant the prairie strip, using the drill or broadcast or aerial seed, you're gonna to wanna to make sure and plant the seeds no deeper than one eighth of an inch into the soil, as most of these seeds are small and won't survive and establish if planted too deep. If you are using a drill, you don't need to follow up with any extra activities, but if you're aerial seeding or broadcast seeding, you're gonna to need to follow up with a cultipacker to sperm the soil and push those seeds into the soil at a very shallow depth. You can use carriers such as potash or other ingredients to help spread the seeds evenly over the area that you're seeding. We chose to plant our prairie strips in May, but there are other options for planting timing of prairie strips. Generally, all of spring can be a good time and also very late in the fall can work to also establish these prairie strips, as long as you don't plant them too early in the fall where the seedlings emerge and then face difficult winter conditions as very, very small seedlings. An important note is that these plantings must be completed within 12 months of the CP43 contract approval to remain in compliance. So after planting, Mowing, burning, or applying herbicides as needed to control unwanted vegetation until the practice is established is advised. For more information on management of your prairie strips, see the CREP maintenance and management video, which covers topics like burning, disking, spraying, and interseeding. So during that establishment year, you're going to want to do this uh, management as often as needed. It could be two to three times over the course of the summer and fall of that establishment year in order to control the unwanted vegetation. After the prairie strips are established, mowing for generic weed control or for cosmetic purposes is prohibited except for mowing between August 1st and August 20th and other management activities like herbicides and burning are only allowed between August 1st and May 1st. For shrubs in these prairie strips, 80% survival is required. Hang and grazing are not generally allowed as part of CP43 contracts, but these contracts can be amended in certain situations for limited 